With inflation still a concern across many Western economies, it's becoming clearer that central banks are some way away from peaking on their move up in interest rates and constricting uh, monetary policy. Despite evidence that growth is suffering and jobs are being lost uh, across all sectors, it remains central banks' priority to combat rampaging inflation. With more on what's happening, and uh, we're joined by Jeremy Lawson, Chief Economist and Head of uh, Aberdeen Research Institute. Jeremy, good to talk to you. Thanks indeed for your time. Just quickly uh, wrap up where you see things at the moment. We are now well into the second month of the year. Markets are still rising, but mm. so are interest rates. And there's evidence that we've seen recently from uh, some central bankers that they don't really intend taking their foot off the pedal anytime soon. Uh, what are your thoughts as a markets economist? I think that the last two weeks in the bond market has really been dictated by the realization that some of the complacency about how quickly inflation pressures would dissipate uh, was not being realized uh, and that also economic growth uh, is is actually a bit more resilient than many thought that it would be at the start of the year so the so the sell-off in bonds really started to gather steam after the uh, after the January pay, non-farm payroll report, right, where the estimate was that non-farm payrolls increased by by, by close to five hundred thousand in the month, and even though there are probably some statistical shenanigans in there that mean you don't want to take that number too much at face value, there's little doubt that underlying demand for labour is quite strong, and then of course we've had you know the CPI data for January producer price uh, index for January, both of which again sort of revealed that underlying inflation is a bit stronger than the market had been factoring in. And so then the new narrative is, well, actually, maybe central banks aren't as close to reaching the peak in policy rates as they had thought, and certainly the market was pricing in. So it's in this process of recalibrating again. Uh, and I think it's sort of quite a dangerous time because risk assets have obviously had a great run over the last sort of three months on the expectation of either a soft landing or what in some circles is being called a no landing scenario. Um, but we think there's a lot of dangers in that because all the preconditions for eventually having to have a recession remain in place. Well, let's, let's pick up on that point as we approach the next lot of uh, US jobs data. I'm looking at some of the data we saw mm. last year, tech companies shedding more than 150,000 workers in 2022, according to the website layoffs. We know that we've seen more this year. There are some substantial numbers as well coming through from some tech companies particularly. Um, but the tech sector is an interesting one, isn't it? Because uh, tech employees are quite mobile. There's this gig economy, which they all seem to work to. And there's going to be a, a big move, I guess, into, for some into freelance work. Uh, as they move. How do you see the non-farm payrolls developing over the next few months, given that some of the layoffs are coming in a sector which is more agile? Yeah, I, I think it's important to keep in mind that the technology sector accounts for quite a small proportion of total employment uh, in, in the United States. Uh, maybe another way to think about it is, that, you know, the tech sector... I think assumes this, casts this enormous shadow over the market because it accounts for and, and homes some of the largest companies in the world and most profitable companies in the world, and they gather a lot of headlines. And so then when layoffs are being announced, you know, that then assumes this sort of greater import or impact than it probably has on the real economy itself. Um, I think the tech sector is really just adjusting to the fact that, you know, the rapid rate of expansion after the pandemic and the fact that demand conditions are a little bit more subdued and that many businesses need to need to right size for what's sort of likely to be a more subdued outlook. But otherwise, yeah. um, that labour demand sort of is actually relatively solid. And this is actually part of the problem, I think, for the Fed is that they were hoping to see a more significant slowing of employment growth and probably actually into a period where it was so weak that the unemployment rate would begin to rise. But there are just no signs of that happening at the moment. It's an interesting word you use there, adjustment. And I guess uh, it's been a long while since we've thought about the normality of interest rates at two, three, four percent. And we've got so used yeah. to seeing them at rock bottom prices. We've adjusted our behaviours to take into account that scenario. How much do you think we should now have to adjust to this 
well, I won't say new scenario because it's not going back to how it was 20 odd years ago uh, when we were used to interest rates at that sort of level. Because surely this is all we're doing, isn't it? Um, we're just getting back to what many of us that have been through it before regard as normality. Is there a truism in that, do you think? I, I guess there's this interesting question of what is normal. I mean, if you think about the last 50 years, you went from a very low interest rate environment to a very high interest rate environment after the 1973 oil shock, and then all the way through to the, you know, to the uh, to the Volcker sort of disinflation, ultimately where rates were sky high in order to bring inflation sort of down from from, from very high levels, and then a 30 year bull run in bonds as those those interest rates have trended down with inflation and 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 neutral real interest rates declined, and so then if you think about it there's really no period that you could say, well, this is like the long-term level of rates and we regard this as normal because it's entirely contingent on the state of the economy and the state of inflation and what policy is having to do. I, th I think the way that we would see things at the moment is that the global economy is operating in what I would describe as a period of excess demand, right? So there's more demand for labor, there's more demand for output than can be supplied. And in those circumstances, that puts up with pressure on wage growth and puts up with pressure on general prices, right? And then what central banks are having to try and do is gauge how high do interest rates need to rise in order to bring inflation back down and the economy back into balance. And that's a very difficult thing to do particularly because a lot of households still have a lot of excess savings floating around from the early parts of the stimulus. But just because rates have to go high this year, last year and this year, it doesn't mean that we're then going to settle into a regime where interest rates are consistently above three or four percent. OK, it's quite possible that when the recession comes, if it's relatively deep, if it lowers inflation quite a lot, if unemployment rates rise significantly, then you could see, you know, say the federal funds rate fall all the way below 1% again. And I wouldn't rule that out. Uh, so actually in our strategic asset allocation work, you know, the, the, the base view um, is, is actually that, say, the 10-year yield is more likely to settle around a 2 2.5% level than it is around a 3.5% level on a 5 to 10-year time frame. So in that case, we might not go all the way back down to the bottom that we saw after the financial crisis or immediately after the pandemic, but there we probably can, once we're through and into a recession, go a lot lower than we are now. It's just really interesting talking about inflation. I mean, people are looking at this and, and they can see inflation. It, crikey, it's, it's bad enough in our pockets. So, yeah. uh, energy prices yeah. rising and so forth, food and fuel and whatever. And mortgages, of course, really big thing. And of course, a lot of people are asking, why are central banks doing this? Because they're raising interest rates to combat inflation, because growth is slowing. And as you say, almost certainly we're going to go yeah. to some form of a recession this year, which is going to hit us hard. Just outline to us, as an economist, why central banks are so focused on inflation. Yes, they've got an inflation target, but why inflation? Why is inflation so important to get under control rather than worry about the potential effects of all rising interest rates taking us down into recession? There's probably two really key points. So the one is that they are they do have legislative mandates to target price stability and they've got particular definitions of that consistent with long-term inflation objectives and most sit around two percent and inflation's a long way below that so by the definition of what they're being asked to do they're failing at the moment inflation is far too high and it's been high for a long period of time so that's that's point one Point two is that central banks and economists would generally see there being no long-term trade-off between unemployment and the economy and inflation. Right? So what I mean by that is um, if, in, if, if unemployment, uh, if labour utilisation is really higher than could be sustained in the long term, right, then, uh, then if, you're, if you're continuing to try and hold it at low levels, all that will really happen is inflation will just keep on ratcheting up and up and up in those circumstances, right? And so eventually expectations, inflation expectations are just higher, right? That gets factored into wage and price setting behavior. And then all of a sudden you're at a higher rate of inflation, right? Uh, and it's much more painful to bring it down. 
it also then means that if there are any future shocks, right, so you let's say another oil shock were to come along and inflation, rather than being at 2% before that happens, it's at 5%. And then people have already seen that, well, in the face of the last inflation shock, central banks didn't really do anything or enough to bring it down. Well, then their whole credibility of that edifice, their confidence in the future um, is eroded. Um, and so, again, that then that what might otherwise have been a transitory, a temporary shock to inflation becomes a permanent one. So central banks, I think, really sort of think that it's very, very important to think about the economy being in balance, right? And unfortunately, the policy errors they made in 2021 in particular of keeping policy too low for too long, of interpreting the inflation surge as a transitory one, has meant that the growth has to slow dramatically and that a recession might be a byproduct of that policy tightening. And whilst a lot of people um, might think that that's a bad thing and it will be painful in the near term, the long-term consequences of not doing enough about it would be even worse as we learned in the 1970s and the 1980s. That is such a, a, a crucial point to underline, isn't it? And I think it's worth emphasising that point you mentioned about the, the, the uh, underlying policy we saw in 2021. At this point, I want to bring up a chart of the S&P 500. And this goes back, if we mm. bring up the chart, on the left-hand side of the chart, I've got the COVID lows back here in March 2020. For the S&P 500, 2,184. Since then, as you've said uh, quite rightly, that loose monetary policy taking us right up 2021 into 2022, the peak coming through from the S&P 500 in January 2022. Since then, there's been this move that we've now seen. Um, just as a, as a markets economist, as someone that runs the Research Institute there at, at Ab Aberdeen, uh, you're talking all the time, of course, to people that are involved heavily with client money. What do you say about where we are in terms of the market move at the moment? Do you see much downside to come? For example, as we're hearing from some IG clients, at least, they're saying we could well get back to the COVID lows. Now, there's a technicality about that. There's a technical analysis element. And if you look at some of the calculations, it could well take us back there. What are your thoughts in terms of where the markets could move this year? Do you think at the end of the year we'll be lower than where we are? What's the direction of travel? Yeah, look, I, I'd be most confident that the direction of travel on a on a six month time frame would be would be lower than we are now. Uh, I think trying to pinpoint exactly what that level will be is very difficult um, because it will depend sort of crucially uh, on the scale of the recession and the decline in corporate earnings. And that's very difficult to forecast in real time. I think what we can say with some degree of confidence is that on reasonable discount rates, uh, that a fair valuation for the market, given the likelihood of, of recessions across many economies and the fact that the market is not pricing in a corporate profits recession, right? so the market is pricing in a soft landing or no landing scenario at the moment, that once that realisation, once that reality is brought to bear um, and you account for the fact that markets do tend to overshoot fundamentals in those periods of heightened uncertainty, uh, then the market will need to drop. I mean, I saw some interesting commentary this morning um, which sort of showed that if you look at the composition of the market in the last sort of few months, more or less the stocks that were damaged the most from the peak to the trough in October last year, they've been the same stocks that have gained the most over the last over the last sort of three months or so. And so there's something I think very fragile within the grain of the market and how it's sort of being influenced by sort of short squeezes, the activity of retail investors, the fact that I think a lot of institutional uh, money, real money investors are still very cautious about the outlook, right? And then given what central banks need to do over the coming months, this sort of mean that I think there's that real vulnerability. Now, whether the market at the end of the year is lower than it is now, well, that again, it depends on the timing of a recession. 
depends on how long the recession lasts for. If you look at how markets behave over time, um, you tend the trough in the equity market tends to be during the recession, but before its end, right? So in fact, it's usually at that point in which the rate of decline in activity is at its peak. And so even if, if, if activity of growth is still declining, if it's declining at a slower rate, the markets can start to improve. So it could well be that you're into a rally before the end of the year, or maybe it doesn't occur until 2024, but certainly we should be pretty confident that the market's unlikely to be able to sustain at its current levels unless a soft landing does materialize. How, how do you deal with the questions that undoubtedly come through from your colleagues that face clients, that clients are worried about all this and think it's an opportunity to sell at the top and buy again at the bottom? Just explain how, how that sort of answer is, is put together to, to establish a fact around the fact that you've just said, difficult to time the markets, isn't it? Well, different Different clients obviously have very different needs, right? The nature of the mandate, you know, the the assets that they have available to them. Uh, what I would sort of suggest is that, you know, un unless you are running or demanding a portfolio that is highly tactical and nimble in its allocation, um, uh, that that sort of that attempt to time and refine too much, particularly if you've got a particular anchor for how you think on a medium term time frame the market needs to evolve is a dangerous thing to do. Um, maybe another way to think about it is through the prism of risk premium in markets. Over the longer term, what investors are really doing is they're harvesting the premium associated with different, you know, with different assets. You know, whether it's term premium in bonds, credit premium in the credit market, um, the equity risk premium, you know, the liquidity premium in private markets, right? And then those will sort of gen tend to generate fairly sort of significant sort of returns over longer horizons that are fairly reliable. There'll be ups and downs, but the longer the time frame, the more likely they are to be realized. But trying to identify precise peaks and troughs can be dangerous because actually a relatively small number of trading days can account for a relatively large proportion of aggregate returns. So unless you must invest over short horizons, unless that's the nature of what you're demanding from your asset manager, right, then it's more, I think, about managing risk than trying to time the market because that could then end up leading to worse long-term returns rather than better long-term returns. Yeah, a really key point. Thank you indeed for underscoring that. Jeremy, we've got to leave it there, but thank you so much indeed uh, for joining us. Uh, Jeremy Lawson. My pleasure. Chief Economist at Aberdeen.